Okay, we'll do a quick sound check. I was having a little bit of trouble with our sound this morning. Does uh, everyone have sound? If you do, give me a quick uh, Y or a yes. Sounds good. Looks like we got sound there. Had a little bit of difficulty with it and didn't realize the headset had gotten knocked out of the USB port just slightly and wasn't connected, so sorry we're a couple minutes late. Welcome everyone here to our third day of the mini mentorship on tape reading and hopefully you guys uh, got a little bit of rest after yesterday sometimes it can be kind of confusing you going through some new things some new ways of thinking about the market and we're going to try to keep it a little bit simpler here today uh, as far as our content goes and uh, probably some things that are fairly basic for most people but I do think it's beneficial as a trader to look at these things uh, to begin, I'm going to put a poll up, and bear in mind the poll is anonymous, um, can't see how you vote, um, and, and I will put up the results of this when it's done just so you can look at the percentages, but you should be given a choice here in a moment, and read down through these options. What we're going to talk about is sim trading or simulated trading, and uh, We'll just allow a minute until everybody has a chance to answer to this. And like I say, just be honest with it. Um, you know, we may tailor the presentation a little, a little bit depending on what people say in terms of a response. So I'll give just a minute here for everybody to fill that out. Okay, so I'm going to uh, close this out. I do show that everybody uh, did respond to the poll. This doesn't show me who responded or how they responded, but it does show me that 100% of you have had an opportunity to vote. So whether that's uh, accurate or not, I don't know. But here's what I'm going to do, and, and we'll just let you take a look at what the response was across the across the room. We got 42% uh, that usually trade live more often than they trade sim. We've got uh, a quarter of you that usually will go to sim either after one loss or a series of losses, and you'll go back to the sim and try to uh, figure out what was going on. And then we got uh, about one out of five that occasionally trades live, one out of five that's uh, sim only that are still learning. So uh, the, the numbers on that, I have found that uh, over the years of working with people, virtually everyone that I've worked with, uh, started out on SIM and stayed on SIM for quite a great deal of time trying to learn uh, not only the platform but learning how to trade. And so when I look at that, I do see some dangers, and I've seen the dangers for years. Um, it, it used to be going back uh, until about a year and a half ago, the only thing I did was private mentorships, and it was just a word-of-mouth uh, referrals where people referred me to their wealthy buddies. And so I have been able to observe a number of the problems that come from sim trading, and that is going to be a bit of our focus today. And I'm going to make some suggestions here today that I would usually do in a in a private mentorship with someone. And this is going back where uh, individuals were paying, uh, you know, fifteen thousand dollars for a private mentorship to have me come sit with them for a week. And I'm going to show you the same thing that I showed them. So take it for what it's worth. Um, you know, I want it to be something that's of value to you, and hopefully, um, you know, you can think about this and put this into your trading plan. But we're going to uh, get going here. You should be seeing, well, I've got a defect, it looks like, on there. Let me change this. Uh, again, standard disclaimer, one thing I will point out about that today Today we are going to talk about some hypothetical or simulated performance because we're going to be taking a look at some charts. And as we look at those charts and we talk about those charts and we're talking about trades, it's obviously not trades that we've taken with real money. So just so you know, when we talk about how things could have gone, would have gone, or should have gone, um, it, it was hypothetical because we're just analyzing charts and looking back at it. So the... The uh, topics for today that I want to go through, uh, first of all, I am going to talk about sim trading. And as I mentioned, we'll make some suggestions there. I'm going to take a look at a few things that you can use. And these are things 
that I would say they're not as clean as tape, but these are things that you can use um, if you cannot figure out the time and sales. If you fight it and fight it and you spend a few weeks trying to figure it out and you just can't get comfortable with it, here are some things that will it will get you reasonably close. We're going to go through a, an action plan for the day's trading. And I'm going to just show you on a platform the process that I would work through or think through in my mind uh, to start my day. And I would do this a few minutes before the session typically. And that's what sets out for me the map that I'm going to follow for the morning. And then I'm waiting to see what price does and, and where it goes. And then we're going to talk about some of the advantages of using price levels. Uh, some of you are using uh, you know, indicators. Some of you are using... Uh, other other methods of filtering or triggering trades, but we're going to talk a lot about uh, picking good price levels and why that's important. And then we'll conclude with uh, something that's just a fairly basic exercise. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of markets and we're going to, to see what we would consider to be relevant size if we were going to put filters on and run two time in sales just so that we could have something that was a little slower uh, for the bigger traders. So that's kind of where we're going to uh, going to go today. The sim trading, if I could get some feedback from you guys, I would appreciate it. And what I would like to see, if you guys don't mind typing in here, uh, reasons that you can think of to sim trade. And I'm going to allow a couple of minutes for this because I, I'm always trying to figure out why people do things and uh, you know why it makes sense. And we started out with a poll. And we realized that uh, not not one person selected no, they trade the live account only. So everyone in here is in the same boat. Everyone sim trades. But if we could get some reasons for that. So let's. I'll just give two minutes here and you guys give me some reasons uh, to sim trade. And again, we've got a couple in here that are newer to trading. We're just referring to the simulated accounts that are available on most platforms where you can go in and place trades manage trades and so forth, but it's not with real money. So I'll, I'll share some of the responses here, and I, and you guys obviously have some uh, some points or some reasons that make sense, and, and some of you may be looking at things very specific to your situation and so forth. Uh, but we've got some nice comments here, and so I'm going to just mention those. Unfortunately, what happens if I try to display this to you, even if I put this list out into the uh, into the display monitor, uh, GoToWebinar will not display one of its own windows. So I could have this sitting right on top where I couldn't even see what I'm presenting to you, and you won't see it. So I'm going to share a few things that ones have, have mentioned. Um, as a rationale for taking trades on SIM. Uh, one of them, the markets change and you continually lose. So we think about that, you know, person that has been trading a while, uh, not doing it to learn their platform, but they just see some changes in the market and all of a sudden they're getting tore up. Uh, one uh, says we can't lose any money, but you can't make any either though. Um, you know, I, I've always told the guys in the room, I, I get a kick out of it. We joke about our sim lunches in there. But the the problem that we run into frequently with that, uh, like as mentioned, you can't make any money and you're putting a lot of effort there uh, for nothing. Uh, we've got some that use it to test out a strategy. Uh, some that say they're new to futures, and so the setups that they were using trading news and earnings on stocks don't work on futures, so they're trying to develop some trading setups. And uh, some sometimes uh, one says it does it when it doesn't fill in the mood to trade. Uh, one says to get familiarized with the order entry platform. Um, another one says that they sim trade if they've lost the limit for the day and want to see if they can figure out what was going on. And then uh, makes a good point that otherwise it's like a video game. doesn't really you know, doesn't really do a lot of good. Uh, to practice this setup, 
uh, when I'm too busy to trade live and pay attention to the market. So, um, and I would say that in that case, you're you're analyzing yourself pretty good. You're recognizing a situation where where you could be in trouble. Uh, you know, distracted. It's not a good place to be trading from. Um, another one says that once they've taken a loss, it's easier to pull the trigger on a sim account than on a real account, and there's no money at stake, so they're not risking more. But you know, the problem again that he's pointing out that he can't make back what he lost. Uh, another another comment here, a little lengthier comment to learn the platform, learn the method. To get confidence, and uh, so so they're relating some of some some of the sentiment that they've gone through. They went through a period earlier where they became gun shy due to losses, and then the sim trading made it worse. And so they say now they only sim to get to know the platform and a few sims to make sure they're following the rules to a new method. And uh, the point that is made here by this gentleman um, is the same viewpoint that I've had of of sim trading for many years. He says, Sim actually lowered my confidence. And I'm going to go into some of the some of the negative impacts that I've observed from that um, over the years. Uh, a couple final comments here. There's a lack of consistency, so fear of blowing an account out again. And then uh, another one that says, looking for a result to believe in, or basically, you know, like some others have phrased it, trying to get the confidence uh, in a strategy or in a method of trading. So when when we look at those reasons, obviously you guys have thought it through, and there's a reason that those things feel comfortable. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to compare the list of things that you guys came up with uh, with the list of things that I came up with, and then I'm going to explain uh, my list on that. So for my list, here's what I have down. Number one, uh, to learn a platform. Um, if you've uh, ever switched platforms, you realize that it can be very difficult to go from one to another, and uh, all of a sudden you're just getting torn up. You can't figure out the buy buttons and the sell buttons, and you're not sure how the strategies work. Uh, you know, like like on Ninja Trader, and you're trying to program the ATM strategy, and you want to make sure that the strategy is going to function right. Um, you know, you you need to be able to do that on Sim. You don't want to put a live trade on that you're intentionally just going to close out at a loss just to make sure the strategies work. So when I look at it from the standpoint of learning a platform, I do see a lot of value there because you can take live market data, you can put that on, you can make sure that that, uh, that automated trade management management strategy worked correctly, and you might need to check the, the entry types, the order types, um, make sure that the trailing stop is working correctly, and you can't really do that unless you have that running on market data. And who wants to do that with real money? Just they're not taking the trade for any reason other than to get the platform down. And so I see a lot of value to that. And, you know, I appreciate that with Ninja, that you can freely go back and forth between Sim and Real. And I, I used it in the beginning, uh, like everyone did. Uh, I wanted to make sure I understood how those trade management features worked. For some of you that are in here, like ones that have migrated over, uh, from trading stocks, maybe something you've never even seen before is the uh, uh, you know the platform, the Ninja Trader platform. Uh, others are using TradeStation across things where they've been able to use that platform for equities and futures. But it is definitely a valid reason there. Here's here's reason number two that I came up with, and even when I thought about it, I still couldn't come up with anything. Other than things I've seen that will hurt people. And while you guys make some points that seem valid at times, um, I, I want to take a look at the destructive side of things and, and the, uh, almost the illogical or the unreasonable side of sim trading to, to show you why it can be damaging, but I also want to show you a way to get out of that. And a, and a way that will do that without hurting you financially. So, when I think about sim trading, here's what I think. We're trying to learn how to trade, and we're going to use an analogy with sports, because it seems like we all can relate to sports usually. So, we're talking basketball here. 
Um, for you overseas guys, I probably should have had football or something that uh, that is popular over there. I don't know how popular basketball is around the world. But let's say you've been selected, uh, you know, you were you were drawn to shoot a free throw on a basketball court in front of 20,000 people, and you get 10 grand if you make the basket. Now you think about a scenario like that, you realize there's going to be a lot of pressure, there's a lot of money on the line, but they've given you one week. So I want to think about that. How would you go about preparing? What would you do? I, I would think that if, if we asked everybody to put a comment out here, most people would probably say they would head down to the basketball court and they would make sure they had a regulation basketball uh, set to regulation pressure and a regulation uh, basket, standard height, and they would shoot free throw after free throw after free throw over and over and over until the minute they had to walk in there and shoot that free throw for 10 grand. But I have to say this, how many of you would come in here and say, well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take a basketball out in my backyard and I'm going to just throw it up in the air about where I think a basket would be. And I'm going to do that for the week. So if you put it into a perspective like that, it makes it seem ridiculous. I mean, you would have to say that all of that work, everything that a person was going through, did absolutely nothing to prepare you for reality. So I'm going to talk about a couple of experiences real briefly that I went through that I personally observed with others. And it's kind of humorous. I, I will say this just in in uh, fair disclosure, fair warning to people. Um, you know, today's session is not going to be so much about tape reading. And so if someone's missing work or someone's having some trouble, just bear in mind that we're going to talk about some practical things, but it, it's not going to be a necessity necessarily for the uh, for the tape reading itself. It's talking about trading in general. So, and we've got a couple that just came in. I'm going to just bring you guys up to speed real quickly. We're talking about SIM trading and why it's destructive. Um, we put a poll out. Uh, everyone in the room does trade SIM at some point. Uh, sometimes it's uh, SIM only just for learning. Sometimes it's occasionally live trading, but usually SIM. Uh, a quarter of the room usually goes to SIM after a loss uh, or a series of losses and uh, just shy of half of the room trades live more often than they trade on SIM. But I'm kind of going through some of the dangers and the problems that come from this. One one experience, I'm going to relate three experiences that I've seen where trading and SIM trading are, are concerned. Uh, I, my brother decided he wanted to be a trader a number of years ago. And he had seen my trading, see what I was doing with it, saw the money I was making with it. He saw me sell my business and work in my pajamas, and that sounded pretty good. So he got a SIM account, and he wanted to trade Forex just because of his schedule, and set up a $100,000 uh, account, SIM account. And he was taking 50, 100 lot trades where, you know, you're talking, uh, you know, like a 100 lot trade, uh, you're talking $1,000 a tick. And he would he would be up or down fifty thousand seventy five thousand dollars and over the course of three months that he set there sim trading he uh, had blown out three or four of these hundred thousand dollar accounts gambling and playing games with it and he he didn't want to take a stop he didn't want a losing trade and he was trying to make himself believe it was real he gets finally to the point where he's he starts making a little bit of money on SIM a little bit consistently, and he figures that it's time to go ahead and put an account out there. So he opens an account, just a mini account. And if anybody's ever traded Forex on a mini account, uh, if you do one lot of the euro US dollar, it's one dollar a tick, or as we would say in the Forex world, it's a PIP, a price increment point. Same thing as a tick, essentially. The spread was too. Uh, two ticks, two pips. So when he initiated his first trade, instantly the trade was $2 against him. Well, he had been throwing around 
positions where he was doing, uh, you know, thousand dollars a tick, and it never bothered him, and he had convinced himself that that felt real to him, and he viewed it just as seriously as real money. So I get a phone call from him, and he says, "Dude, I, I took my first live trade, and I'm in trouble." He's like, "I don't know what to do. Can't I just? I feel like I should just close it out." And I said, "Well, what's going on?" And he says, "Well, I don't know what's going on. This thing is down. It's down seven dollars." And it's, you know, anybody that's ever watched the 6E uh, on futures or watched the Euro US dollar, um, you think about your spread, you're down two bucks because of the spread, and it's only moved five ticks from where his entry was. And and he's down seven dollars, and he's crap in his pants. Now, I kind of look at that, and I have to... I have to say it was one of the most foolish things I've ever heard because I knew his financial situation. His house is paid for. His cars are paid for. He's got a very, very good income. No money pressure whatsoever. He's down 7 bucks and he's freaking out, calling me on the cell phone, trying to figure out whether he should just bail out and close it because he can't decide what's wrong. So, you know, I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, the... The bizarre thing is that we can sit there and convince ourselves that that sim is beneficial, and yet it's actually setting us up to deal with dangerous emotions and panic and and potential failure down the road. And I told him, I said, uh, you know, if you saw a $20 bill blow by on the street, you wouldn't run to chase it. I know him. I know he wouldn't walk across the street to do it. And yet seven bucks and he's messing his britches. So I, I see that type of reaction and I've watched many traders when they tried to go from sim to live and they absolutely could not do it and they're right back on sim. They get a loss, they're right back on sim. They sit there, they they hesitate on four or five trades, they go right back to sim. Uh, they'll They'll get ready, they're working themselves up for this, they're deciding that they're going to go ahead. Uh, they're going to take this live, and they, they hesitate four or five more trades. They go right back on SIM and trade SIM another week. And and ultimately, I would say that there's something that happens here. We frequently see traders that are pushed into this market that should not be in this market. Um, and, and what I mean by that, when you look at the pattern day trader rules, if a guy was going to go in and trade 100 shares of a $5 stock, which would be relatively safe, worst case, you risk 500 bucks. That's what you lost. They tell you you can't do that it, it, You know, as a day trader. You can't trade in and out of that stock as a day trader unless you've got 25 grand in your account. If you do that you know, four times in one week where you trade in and out once a day, Four times at some point during a week, they freeze your account and you can't initiate any new trades. And yet, they'll let us take that same $500 and come in here on a futures contract. And if you punch in today's price on the S&P, you multiply that, uh, uh, you know, that value where it is at 1185. You're talking $60,000 contract. They'll let us take a $60,000 position with our 500 bucks but they won't let us take a $500 position with our 500 bucks. So we get into a position that is dangerous, and in the back of our minds we know it's dangerous, and it makes it very difficult to keep going back to it and pulling the trigger, and it can take money from us too fast. So I don't know if anyone has experienced anything like that when they've tried to go from sim back to live, that it can be very difficult to do. The the other story that I want to relate, and I'm going to I'm going to relate a third story to show you some of the danger uh, in not sim trading or not trading correctly according to size. But I'm going to talk first of all about a second event, and a couple of you guys have heard me talk about it and laugh about it in the room, and we joke around about the sim lunch because of this guy, and he's a buddy of mine. I I talk to him all the time, I tease him about it all the time, but he decided he wanted to be a trader, opened up his sim account. I worked with him online, and, and it, it, I did it kind of as a begrudging favor. Didn't want to do it. The guy was uh, was just extremely hyper, and, and I felt he was going to be a gambler. And 
you know, so he got his SIM account there. And so each morning I would talk with him about it and explain things. And I explained the platform to him and got him all comfortable with how to place an order. And he's all ready to go. And this guy, if you could look up the word tight in a dictionary, his picture would be right next to it. Um, he had money, had to, uh, actually had a lot of money. And everything he owned was paid for free and clear, no debts, was in, a, was in a solid financial position. But he literally, they were so tight, and it was the reason they had money, is he would take $5 a month for spending on like pop or a hamburger or something of that sort. And his wife got 5 bucks a month. So he comes in and he starts SIM trading. And I had cautioned him about SIM trading. And I said, you know, you have to make it real. This is, you know, the, the emotion that's going to be there. And he's like, oh, I'm scared to death. He's like, I'm scared to death even on SIM. Well, he goes in there on the first day and he makes $600, you know, just in his little morning of playing around on SIM. And he gets so excited, he takes his wife down and buys her a steak lunch. And he's eating his steak lunch before he realizes that it wasn't real money. And he, he honestly thought he had made 600 bucks. And he was so excited, he went down, you know, bought a $40 lunch. And his whole allowance is, is gone. Everything is blown. And he's sitting there going, you got to be kidding me. What do I do? Again, I think what it illustrates is that essentially when we're sim trading, we are so out of touch with reality that that it's it's how can it possibly do us good and and so we laugh about him in the room about our sim lunch um you know that that we can go by if we did something on sim you know you can get your sim lunch and and I tease him about it all the time now that that being said i'm going to jump forward here a couple slides and and make a statement, and then I'm going to explain why I also say this. For each person that comes into trading, we know, we're told up front that we have to have risk capital. And that money that we're putting into the market, it should be something that is sized or suited to our situation. Yeah, Brian Brian says a sim steak here. So that's uh we'll send sim steak out at Christmas for everybody, I guess. Maybe that's what we'll do. But anyways, we we look at our situation, um you know what I risk, what you risk, what the next guy risks. It's probably going to be different in every case based on our situation. The first time I ever worked with somebody and did a mentorship with somebody, I I was trading, but I also owned a business. And I was out at a customer's home, and I saw that he was trading. And so I struck up a conversation with him about trading, and I showed him a couple things. He was asking questions, and he's been losing money. And I asked him, this this was in late March of the year, and I asked him how the year was going for him, how he was doing. And he says, well, he says, I'm down 380 grand so far this year. This is day trading. And he doesn't know how, but he's just trying to learn. And by by March, he's already down $380,000. And I about messed my pants. You know, that's, uh, uh, to me, 380000 400000 450 that's a good year for me. That's a good year of gains. And he's blown that out in three months just trying to learn. And I said, well, what's your, what's your end plan for this? What are you doing with this? And he says, well, he says, I figured I could give it a year, year and a half. And if it didn't work, it didn't work. And he had no problem with it. And, and I was astounded. But he had lost that much money and he was going in trying to learn trading 20s and 50s. Didn't make sense to him to try to make money with ones first, with one lots. He felt he needed to go straight to 20s and 50s, and he was getting his butt kicked. And yet, the ironic thing is he was risking an amount of capital that was appropriate to his situation. And he he did have a solid plan with it. Is He, he realized he could lose a million and a half, and it wouldn't affect his life, 
And if he couldn't get it by that point, he wasn't going to be a trader. He would just allow his financial advisors to handle his, his money. So, you know, I, I go back to our, to our topic a moment ago. We've got regulations that say we can't trade uh, a stock, a low-priced stock, and try to get a 15, 20 cent move during the course of a day because that's too dangerous. We, we can go into the futures market and trade whatever we want to trade, and that's a okay. We take, uh, you know, there's some, some of you guys are uh, not in the U.S., and I don't know what the regulations are country by country. But for those of us that are in the U.S. or in countries who regulate like the U.S., we have other things that we could trade, like CFDs, a contract for difference. And a CFD, we could go open an account. And I shouldn't say we could because we can't. It is it is available to people, but it's not available to people in the United States. Technically, you know, if we lived in Canada, we could go open an account with a firm in London trading contracts for different CFDs, and we could trade, you know, the S&P 500 chart. We could go trade that CFD at one pence a point. Essentially, we instead of risking 12.50 a tick, we could risk a few cents a tick, or we could size it anywhere we wanted in there, and we could go learn with an appropriate amount of capital on the line for our situation. But, you know, in its in its wisdom, the uh, the regulatory commission say no. U.S. citizens cannot trade CFDs. So we start looking around the uh, the different instruments that are available to us. And for guys that are trading four or $5,000 of capital that are hoping to make a success trading, there really is nowhere to go. There's nothing that you can trade, essentially, that's safe. They'll, they'll let you go into the futures, let you go into the options, uh, but you're, you're pretty well stuck with something that is that is going to have you trading more size than your account should be able to withstand. So when I look at what they've done and I ask the question, how can you break away from the SIM accounts? Uh, I'm going to thank just a minute for some of the dangers that I see with SIM accounts um, that the stories illustrated is you're out of touch with reality. It's comfortable and so you can go in there and do it and do it and do it and do it. And you go back to the live account and now you can't function. You can't do it. You can't deal with the pressure. You can't sit on the winning trade. Um, you know, you're up two, three ticks and it goes back against you by six or seven. And it comes back two or three ticks positive and it goes back six or seven negative, And it comes back one or two ticks positive and you kill the trade. You never do that on SIM. So SIM tends to give a guy a sense of confidence but the confidence that he gains cannot carry through into the live trades necessarily. So a guy can come in very confident. They they come back. The, the uh, confidence has evaporated and they're making bad decisions again right away. Uh, I, I do have one comment here on the CFDs. Um, the... The CFDs, and it depends on where you open, the comment is that uh, CFDs won't let you go as low as one cent per point. And there there are firms out there that will go uh, a pence. There are ones that will let you go uh, a pound a point, uh, some of the London firms. There are ones that will let you go just about as low as you want. And the spread betting, um, which is kind of, a, you know, that seemed to be something that really grew out of London. Um, and, and there were actually some advantages to London-based traders because they don't have to pay taxes on it. Uh, the spread, spread betting will let you go lower uh, than that. But there there are some firms out there that will let you cut that down uh, considerably lower on the CFDs. And ironically, you know, the U.S. says, well, that's too dangerous of an instrument, but CFDs are the most, most widely traded instrument in the world, more than any future, more than any stock, more than any option. Um, very, very widely traded contract. Yeah, I was watching that. I'm I'm at 39 minutes. I appreciate that, Gerardo. I'm going to I'm going to reset this here for just a minute. Now, what I'm going to do uh just in preparation for stuff a little bit later, um I'm going to put up a poll and the uh, the poll's going to be on trade management 
And so I'm going to put that up and I'm going to stop the recording and reset that real quick. Again, I will just mention that the the polls are anonymous. Um, you know, you can't can't see who voted what way. So just uh, just be honest with it. We'll we'll kind of tailor the presentation to some of the responses here. Okay, so we got this back. I'll put the results up here. Let me close this out. Everybody's had a chance to pick an answer. So as you look at this, you know, you know what uh, what you voted. But you can kind of see that that even rating your own management, it's it's obvious that things would be better if it was done differently. So so when you look at that, essentially with these numbers, um, one one person essentially would feel that they've got uh, not many flaws. It might have been two that selected that actually, but for everybody else in the room, there's there's definitely some room for improvement. So what what do you guys think would be one of the most valuable things that you could do when it came to management? Would would you agree that one of the most valuable things you could do uh, for management? Let's see if this screen. Oh, it shut off the screen sharing. That this would be one of the most valuable things you could do. So we've got we got people putting some comments in here. Um, you know, to let the profits run, uh, to trade more products and scale out more, uh, to be able to interpret the tape, uh, to be able to follow the trading plan. And see, those are just, those are common things that blow most people apart. Uh, just by the way, with the comment on interpreting the tape, um, I, I virtually never, ever will manage an exit on the basis of the tape. Um, it is it is for the entry and the target my profit is always going to come off the chart and so you know we're going to spend a little bit of time on that i will show you guys how i manage and what i think has been very successful for me um you know everybody's temperament is different and their their uh, emotional control is different uh, the guys that trade with me in the room um well in fact i've i've got a nice uh, croupier stick from from like a crafts table for raking the money off the table from from my buddy Ken who's in the room and he he keeps telling me take the money off the table take the money off the table and I'm going no it's not to my target yet it's not there yet it's not there yet so as a as a kind gift and a joke he got me a little croupier stick that sits on my desk now uh, for raking the money back off the table raking the chips in so I you know I look at that management as being something so critical even though we're talking about tape reading in this primarily um to be a successful trader to me says we've got to spend a session talking about management because that's where most people ultimately even if they can get the entries pegged they're still going to fail because of the management so um a couple of you i think have hit on what what i feel is the key um you know, there, there, we've got three comments out here about scaling out, try to get risk-free, let the runner run. Another one that says let the runners go instead of just taking the profits. And I, I think you guys will see, you know, if we get some live trading and, and uh, start looking at things, um, that is a critical, critical part of the trading is being able to let those runners go and really make us some money. But for now, we'll get back to, uh, in this poll, we're going to talk about the management, but I wanted to get an idea of where you guys were at. But let's get back to to trying to find a way to get off of the sim and and not allowing that to hurt us. And th the way that I'm going to suggest doing that, um, I, I want to give fair disclosure here with it. Um, I guess I want to try to present a balanced and accurate view of what I'm going to suggest for you guys. And each of you guys are going to have to look at your own circumstances and decide if that's relevant to you. But I have found that the majority of people have accounts that are definitely not large enough 
to be trading futures. Um, I frequently turn down customers that contact me, and and they've got uh, you know they've got a five six thousand dollar account, and then they want to spend you know a couple three thousand dollars of their savings uh, for education, and then they tell me they've been unemployed for a couple years. Their unemployment is about to run out. Their wife's income won't pay the bills. They can't find a job. And as sad as it is, you know, I, I can't I can't work with people like that. I, I don't feel that it's ethical. I don't feel that it's fair because the chances when you get all of this pressure, the chances of making it big are so slim, it's it's just stealing from, from somebody that can't afford to be stolen from. So to me, when I look at the at the conundrum that people are in, we've got an account that's too small, but it's the only market that we feel safe with because it's regulated and because uh, you know there's a little bit of protection there for us. And we end up putting the money in there, and uh, and we're trading too big, which forces us onto the sim. It forces us into bad, uh, excuse me, forces us into bad management and into bad decision making, and so on. So I have suggested for a number of years to clients that they seriously consider looking at the Forex marketplace. And I'm going to try to give you just a balanced viewpoint of what Forex you know, presents in terms of dangers, but why it also can be very attractive. Uh, you guys may have opinions of Forex. In fact, if you don't mind... Uh, you know, just just while I'm talking, throw out what you think of forex. You know, just a positive or negative. You don't have to make an extended comment. But a lot of people have heard so many stories about forex that they're scared to even touch it. And I have found, ironically, there are many, many times the number of forex traders that there are futures traders. But for some reason. Uh, a lot of us as futures traders hear this negative rap about forex. So here's here's a couple of the problems with forex, but then I want to take this to some of the advantages that forex can give people if a person is really serious about building himself into a career trader. First of all, forex is not a regulated market, and we've all heard that. And it is it is regulated in a degree. Now, they are starting to put some restrictions on it. First, they changed the capital uh, reserve requirements for U.S. brokers. I have uh, uh, some changes that have affected many clients, and they're and they're mad about it that they came in and and lowered the leverage from 400 to one to 50 to one. And so, you know, these these changes they they are trying to rein it in because it has become so fraudulent. I have had a guy in Spain after me for for three years trying to get me to back him in starting a Forex brokerage. And his sales pitch to me is that you cannot lose. All you have to do is get customers and you take the other side of the customer's orders and you take their entire account. And he has contacts with uh, MetaTrader and he has shown me documentation within MetaTrader from the back end side, from the broker side. There are over 60 settings in MetaTrader that a broker can set to take your account. He can do it fully automated. It's programmed into the platform. And he keeps using this to try to convince me to start a Forex brokerage and take people's money. And unfortunately, there are enough unscrupulous people like this in the business that they will open up a firm simply because they know most people lose. They will take the other side of those trades. Those trades are never put into the broader market, into the interbank market. And the brokerage takes the other side, and you lose, and they own your account. And all they have to do is generate new customers. So there, there are some dangers to the Forex marketplace because of that. I have had accounts at around 30 different firms. Uh, over the years, I have traded Forex for a number of years. Out of the 30 firms, I only found two of them 
that were ethical and honest. And here's what would happen when you started out trading. You're told when you start out trading that you're guaranteed what you see is what you get in terms of pricing. So if they're quoting you a a one tick spread, they guarantee you that when you click, what price is there is the price you'll get. And there's a little asterisk there that says, except in unusual market conditions and fast moving markets. So you open the account and you start out trading and every entry is an instant fill at your price. No slippage, no games, no messing around. Within a month's time, you cannot get them to fill an order. And and what changes is they're tracking the account, and if they realize that you're a profitable trader, they turn off your auto execution, they will not take the other side of your trade, and most of them cannot even go into a Tier 2 bank and offset your order. If they can, eventually they'll give you the fill, but if they can't, I've had brokers that requoted me for a solid hour. And and by a requote, what I mean is they, they tell you up front, unless it's a, a news-related thing, you'll get the fill where you click. Well, you click, buy me at this price, and it pops up a message and says, uh, your order is being transmitted to the market. So you wait 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 seconds, and then it pops up and it says, the price quote has changed since you clicked. The price is now at, and they give you a new price. Do you still wish to submit this order? So you say yes. 30, 40, 50, 60 seconds, it pops up and says, the price has moved since you submitted your order. The price currently is at such and such. Do you still want to submit this order? And I have done that on a couple of occasions just to see whether they would ever fill it. And I went over an hour, and they would not fill the order. So it told me that broker doesn't even have a connection to a Tier 2 bank. They're running a a complete 100% bucket shop on the basis of of a quote. And they're taking a quote, you know, off of uh, Reuters uh, quote feed. And they'll make a quote for you, but if you're a a successful trader, they will not fill your position, period. And it would typically change within about three to four weeks, and all of a sudden you couldn't get a fill. And I have had that happen at every broker where I opened an account with the exception of two of them, that within the month I could not get a fill. So they are sitting there taking a look at things, and they're saying, this guy's successful. We will not take the other side of him, and we don't want to let him have a share of our other customers' money because we want that money, and and he's typically right, so we're just not going to give him a fill until he leaves us. That He'll, he'll just get disgusted and leave. So you you have situations like that arise, and you have to say that puts a bad taste in your mouth about the entire marketplace. Um, Some other common things that Forex brokers will do to you, disreputable brokers, uh, is a practice called shading. And I'm I'm going to mention, I'm mentioning these things for a specific reason because I really do believe in full fair disclosure. And I'm going to make a suggestion to you guys. I want you to consider it seriously in view of your own unique situation. I at least want to warn you of what's there, and I also want to show you the positive side. But the practice called shading, they will take a quote coming off the inner bank. And this would be the rate that your largest banks trade amongst themselves with. And then the what are called the Tier 2 banks, this would be banks that were a little smaller. They weren't these big monsters like Citibank and Chase and so forth. Um, the Tier 2 banks will typically try to trade into one of the uh, Tier 1 banks. So you might get like your local bank, if you had to do a currency transaction, they would, your local bank would be like a, like a tier two bank. And they would go to, to someone who's agreed to handle their trades. They might go to UBS or Citibank. And they say, could you please provide us a quote? Well, UBS will look at the, at the interbank quote. And then they will change the quote by a couple ticks give that quote back to your bank and say, do you want to execute at that price? And that bank says yes. 
Well, the bucket shop will take that a step further, and they might move it by 10, 15, 18 ticks and give you a quote because they know, worst case, if they have to offset into the market, they can do so and immediately put you back at an 18-tick disadvantage. So everybody provides their own quotes. There is no exchange. There's no price matching engine. You don't have tick data. You don't have a time in sales. Um, you can't even get accurate volume data because there is no place to get volume data. Each broker has its own book, its own volume, and it's not relevant to what the, the broader market or the interbank market is doing. And it doesn't matter whether the firm says they have a dealing desk or not. They all do. If they don't have a dealing desk staffed with people, they have an algorithm trading against you. It, it is there at every firm. They have to have a dealing desk because of the nature of the business. So it's either electronic or it's manual. So there, there are some dangers there. And where you see these horror stories and the bad things that happened, it is primarily coming from the fact that most of these brokers are complete disreputable crooks who went into business and their only goal was to take their customers' accounts. But that being said, I want to look at the flip side of things. If you do get a reputable firm, you have a market which is by far uh, the largest daily dollar volume uh, of any market. It's larger actually than all stock exchanges in the world put together in terms of dollar volume. So it definitely has liquidity and it has liquidity 24 hours a day. And if you get with a good firm, um, your, your liquidity is there 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. News events over the weekend don't hit you. Uh, your stop will still be honored. You can still go $10 million a click on the weekend when everything else is closed. And you've got the ability in this marketplace to scale your size relative to your account. So I'm going to put the names of, of two firms out to you guys, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys, you know, how far you want to go with this and what you do with this. For a large trader, um, the best firm out there is Dukas Copy. It's D-U-K-A-S-C-O-P-Y. And it is an ECN uh, business model. So they do provide true quotes. They don't take the other side of the trades. Um, there is a unique advantage that Dukas Copy offers large traders that you will not find, to my knowledge, in any other market in any other firm. And what they will allow you to do is they have a, a, a process, what they call gar uh, bank guarantee trading. And as an example, I have an account that is sitting in a, in a very large New York bank in one of my corporation's names. I have a trading account at Duke, Duke's Copy that is in that corporation's name. I do not have a penny sitting with Duca's copy. My money is in my account, in my name, in New York City. And Duca's copy has the right to post funds into that if I make a profit, or they have a right to pull funds out if I lose. Um, you will not find another situation like that, to my knowledge, as a retail trader anywhere. But to get that benefit, it has to be $250,000 minimum account size. So to me, when I've looked at the dangers of the Forex market, everybody heard of Refco. Refco went under. They basically took the customer accounts. They went to their bank and they said, we want to borrow X number, you know, this, this many hundred millions of dollars. And for collateral, we're going to let you hold these accounts as collateral. And they took those accounts where all the customers' funds were, were aggregated together, and they said, you can hold those as collateral. And then when, when Refco lost the money that they borrowed and they couldn't make it good, the banks came in and they had the rights to your money, and you didn't have the rights to your money. Now, this can happen in the Forex world, and they tell us it can't happen in the futures world, but bottom line, it does happen in the futures world. Uh, a lot more than people realize. 
But in the case of Refco, people only got back 35 cents on the dollar after roughly a, a three-year legal battle. Well, everybody looks at that and says, man, it's dangerous. I can't deal with the chance of that happening. So if, if a person is a large trader, uh, it's the only situation I'm aware of in the world where you can have the money in your account, in your name, in your bank, and yet you can still go trade that money in another institution who can't touch your funds other than to post or, or credit uh, you know, losses and, and, and uh, gains for the day. Um, there's, there's a couple dangers to that. They just recently started taking smaller traders. Um, it was a $50,000 minimum up, uh, account. And they didn't allow trading in small lot sizes. Uh, their accounts, uh, for my accounts, the, the smallest size that I can trade is $100,000 positions. Um, the standard size is $250,000 positions. But they have been absolute, honest, ethical, straight up, and they've provided account protections that I cannot get anywhere in any market. The other firm is, uh, it, it's Awanda. And, I don't know. I will. I will show you the trading platform in a minute, and we'll talk about it then. But what I have found with them, with Awanda, their reputation in the industry was that they catered to small traders. And Awanda had a different business model many years ago, and this is where it can be of a lot of value to some of you guys that have smaller accounts. They would allow a guy to open an account. Years ago, when, when everybody else in the industry was $100,000 lots only, they would allow you to open an account and put 5 bucks in it if you wanted to, and you could trade $1 into a euro or $1 into a pound or into a yen and run your trade. And you couldn't make money, you couldn't lose money, you know, on that basis. It just, it it cannot move far enough to allow you to make money. But by the same token, it would allow you to place trades with real money where there was a measure of accountability. They limited the, uh, you know, the leverage on their accounts 50 to 1 when everybody was going 400 to 1. And they said that's not safe. And Awanda kind of got a reputation in the industry as being a goofy little place for small traders. And yet, about three years ago, when they put on the uh, capital reserve requirements out of hundreds of U.S. Uh, brokers, there were only 14 of them that were able to meet the $5 million requirement. And of those 14, only two of them would have been able to meet the $10 million requirement that they proposed. Here's what's interesting. At that point in time, Saxo Bank was, they had the greatest amount of cap reserves, $455 million of cap reserves. And Awanda had $287 million of cap reserves. And then you looked at the next largest, and they were like $8 million. So it is an extremely large firm. And, I, and I'm going to put the, let me just, I've got a couple of requests to put the name out here. And you guys hopefully will get that in a little chat message there. But the the firm that I'm referring to right now, it was started by a gentleman named Olson, and it's the it originally was called Olson and Associates, and so they took that uh, O and A, but then they started pronouncing it Awanda. So for whatever goofy reason, it had some they've got some little story on their site why they started pronouncing it that way. But it was Olson and Associates, and the other one was Dukas Copy. So you guys should have something in your chat there um, that, that shows you the name and the and the website. But here's where I think this can be beneficial uh, to you as a trader. And I'm going to, if I can find my platform, I'm going to just put the platform up here, and and I want to point something out to you guys get this all kind of resized on, on the platform 
they allow you to come in on your accounts, and you can create as many sub-accounts as you want. And so just for the purposes of showing you this, I just created a sub-account, a secondary account, and I transferred 50 bucks from my primary account into it. And here's where I really do, uh, there is a reason I'm going through these things uh, with people, because for guys with smaller accounts, to succeed as a trader, you're going to have to be able to take a trade that is that is a good size trade relative to your account. So here's here's the uh, the setup that we've got with things. I transferred fifty bucks in here. Haven't taken any trades on it. I just like I said, I just set up a secondary account for the purposes of doing this. And interestingly, for guys that are interested in hedging, they just took away the ability to hedge uh, in the forex market. All you have to do is just open another sub account, and you could take a, a long term, uh, uh, you know, short position in the euro U.S. dollar, and you could open a sub account and take a short, short term position in the U.S. You could you could have 15 different positions in the euro U.S. dollar, and none of them will affect the other ones. You just open a sub account, put a little money in there, and take positions there. But here's where I think it can be beneficial. You could put 20 bucks in here. And if you put a $20 bill in here and you took trades on that basis, that it was real money, that $20 bill is going to do more towards making you a trader than 10 years of sim trading will. Because that $20 bill means something to you. You don't want to see it disappear. So you can come in and you can structure your account in such a way that when you go to place an order ticket, it will configure that order ticket for you. And I'm going to show you real quickly how you can do this. If I can find the window that it opened up. Here it is. I can come in for my trading purposes, and I can go to the euro, and I can set this up specifically for the euro, and I can say when I trade the euro, I want to trade 500 units. Now, a unit would be... Uh, if I did one unit, that would be converting one dollar into a euro, or converting one euro into a dollar, depending on which which way I went. But I could set this to be a percentage of my account. I could set it to be a specific dollar value, um, or I could say units. So I'm going to just leave that units. I'm going to say my trade size is 500 units. I can say I want my default stop loss to be 50 pips, or I could come in and say I want my my stop loss to be 2% of my net asset value, or in other words, the entire 50 bucks of the account, or whatever the value was if I had open positions. Um, and I can set my default take profit. I could make that 4% or 5% so that I put myself in automatic order um, that gave me a good risk reward. So for my purposes, just in setting this up, I'm going to say, you know, I on the euro, uh, you know, on a, on a trade, I want a 40 pip stop and I want a 200 pip take profit. And then I'm going to just apply that, uh, you know, by saving. And I'm going to show you what happens when you go to place an order. I can do uh, market orders. I can do limit orders, whatever I want to do. But I want to show you guys something. I put in that 40 tick stop. And we think about a 40 tick stop uh, if we were trading the S&P. Um, you know, when you when you think of what you're risking there on a trade uh, at twelve dollars and fifty cents a tick, you take a forty tick stop on the uh, on the euro. You know, on the six E currency future, not many people have an account large enough to take that type of a stop and say, "Yeah, I can risk five six hundred dollars a trade." But if you look down at the bottom here, I can take a position where my stop is going to cost me two bucks. Now I, I look at that and say that's real money, but it's a, it's two bucks. It's not significant. It won't hurt my life. It won't affect me. Can't put my family out on the street, but you know, by God, it can teach me to trade. You know, it's real. It's relevant to me. If I lose that twenty bucks, I'm going to be mad. If I blow out a, a sim account, who cares? It's meaningless. And so when I look at the value that's here. I, I have to go back and say, okay, we open up a futures account and we have to put twenty five hundred or three thousand dollars in there at a minimum, and we're risking that entire 
3000 bucks, and it's very likely that we're going to lose it. We come into an account like this, we can put 50 bucks in there, and we can say, you know what, Forex, they're totally crooks. Uh, it, it's a gruesome industry. Everybody takes advantage of it. There's no protection if the firm goes bankrupt. Guess what? I'm risking 20 bucks or 50 bucks. It doesn't matter. It's not like I'm blowing out my $3,000 account. If it goes bankrupt and I didn't get back but 20% of that in two years, who cares? But bottom line, it teaches me to trade with real money on the line. So I go back to what I said earlier. You know, We can't imagine if we were trying to, to learn how to shoot a free throw and there was money on the line, we wouldn't imagine going out and taking an imaginary ball and throwing it at an imaginary hoop. We would want to do the real thing. And so for some individuals, one of the most successful things they can do is take an account like this and use this as they're learning how to trade. Now here's, here's the problem, but I'm also going to point to the solution. We come into this market, and let me just close this. Oh, and, and by the way, just in case you're wondering, I'm going to change this to one unit. I'm going to change my stops to, uh, to pips. And I'm going to put in here, uh, I, I'm going to say that I would take a, a 1,000 tick loss. That 1,000 tick loss would only cost me 10 cents. So you can scale this infinitely to the, to the point of stupidity. So um, for a guy that's just working with, with a couple thousand dollars, um, you know, to put a hundred in here and trade a hundred dollars of real money and actually be able to scale out at multiple price points. See, I could come in and I could, I could put a, a 10 lot order and I could put a reasonable stop for a swing trade, maybe a hundred ticks. And that order is going to, going to risk me 10 cents, but I could take that 10 lot off in 10 different pieces. So we look at some of the comments that you guys made, uh, Trying to get more contracts, trying to be able to scale out, trying to let runners go. See, here we have a market with a Wanda. Um, it's open uh, 365 days a year. They never close. So we can come in over the weekend, take a swing trade. doesn't matter. We, we could let it go for a week. It, it's irrelevant. It, it will hit. Now, I will say, could they go bust? And you have to say, yes, anybody could. Refco did. Refco was huge. Anybody could go bust in this market. But uh, I, I personally have placed literally thousands of trades at a Wanda, and I have never once had a trade that I questioned and said didn't happen. Something's wrong. They ripped me off. Um, every single order that I've had, every stop was hit at the price that I had in there. Never had one ran through. Every take profit was hit right where it sat. Um, I, I've never been shaded. I've never been uh, requoted. You know, if I if I want to take this this 10 lot here and I hit submit, you look at my price, it's, it's giving me a quote, you know, 48 uh, here. There's a little spread. There's no commission. So if I take this trade, you'll see this trade appear up in my window. And I'm going to just submit this trade and buy the euro right here. And here's my trade. And you can see my profit in U.S. dollars uh, you can see, you know, my long position is there. It's there instantly at the price that was there when I clicked it. My stop loss is in place. If I took this back out on the time frame a little bit, um, scale it around. You can see it's got my take profit order sitting up here. My stop loss is here. I can trade it off the chart. I could say, no, I only need to risk it to right there. The position is just instantly filled. I, I've got a slight negative profit because there is right about a one pip spread, but that's the cost of doing the business. Um, the execution is good. The, the stability of the platform has been outstanding. Uh, everything has worked for years, and it's a it's an ugly, gimpy, basic little platform, but the thing works beautiful. And I could take this trade, I could shut it off, and the platform doesn't have to be on. The orders are on their server. Um, that goes down and hits my stop. It don't matter whether my computer's crashed or not. It's sitting on their server, and they just take me out of the position. Everything's fine. Nothing to worry about. But the thing that it allows a guy to do, again, is you can take something that's appropriate to your account size. So the downside to this 
if I wanted to look at indicators, they're fairly basic. I don't even know how to add indicators. I don't use them. Oh, add study. Um, you can see here in this list that they do have some basic indicators that you can put on. And it's not a fancy charting platform, but you, you notice that you can't get like a, a true volume. You can't get a time in sales. And, and so does that defeat everything that we're trying to do? Well, here's, here's the, uh, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this as a five minute chart. And then I'm going to bring in a five minute chart. And let me just scale this around if you'll bear with me for one moment. Actually, let's do this. I'm going to reset the recording and I'm going to get a couple things up here in the window. And then uh, uh, we'll go through this and I will show you guys a way to do this while you're still, uh, you know, while you're still uh, reading tape and still using your NinjaTrader platform. Uh, let me get let me get Brian's question first. How does it know how much cash you are putting up per trade? Um, when when I go to place an order, let me just pull this order in here. I I have it sized in units, and if if you want to look at the actual position, and let me just uh, drag this back down. You know, I took a ten unit position in the Euro US dollar, and so the the exposure tab will show me what that actually breaks down to. What that did to get me ten units of the Euro long. It meant I had to sell fourteen dollars, convert that into euro to get ten euro. So the the U.S. dollar value of that position, the short, was fourteen dollars, and my long position is fourteen oh five. So I don't know if that answers your question, but when you look at the cash per trade, you can size that a couple ways. You can come in here on your your uh, default settings. And and you can tell it what you want it to to be. Like we look at the default order size. I could say U.S. dollars, and I could say I want my default trade to be 10 U.S. dollars. So I'm going to just apply that. Actually, let me put that on the euro. And they they have so many currency pairs. They they've got so many exotics. You can do whatever you want. But uh, I'm I'm setting this default order size will be 10 dollars, and then I'm going to go ahead and put this over here. And you notice because because on the forex market this is trying to get me long on the euro. I said the U.S. dollar position needs to be ten dollars. Um, so to do that, this is going to tell me that would be essentially buying seven euro. So it's going to calculate that out for you. If you if you wanted to do that differently, if you said uh, do me a thousand, uh, you know units. That that would get me a thousand euro, so it would be a you know at fourteen hundred U.S. dollars to get that position. I've got fifty to one margin, so technically this tells me I I have available seventeen hundred and sixty nine units. If I put on full size on this thing, my forty point stop is going to cost me seven dollars, but it's allowing me to take a position somewhere around twenty three twenty four hundred dollars U.S. with my little fifty dollar account. You can you can do that manually, Brian, or you can you know it's just part of the forex market and you get used to it. But let me let me reset the recording and I'm going to pull in a 6E chart and I'm going to adjust this chart just a little bit uh, so that it's a little easier to see. And then we'll uh, we'll explain how this could work to your benefit, uh, even if you still trade the S&P, even if you're still trading the NQ. When you go back to SIM instead of going back to SIM. You can go over to the 6E, and when you go to the 6E, you can chart that. You can use the 6E time and sales, the 6E volume, uh, and, and you come in here and take your position on the spot market. Um, so let me get that set up. I'll be back in about two minutes. And uh, In fact, actually, let's just do this. Let's just take five minutes, if that's okay, and we'll go through this, and then we'll hit some of these other topics real quick. Uh, let's just say, uh, well, what time is it? Let's just say 25 after. We'll we'll be back in here at 25 after. Okay, so we're back here and fighting the platform. You guys should be able to see the screen, I think, okay. What I've got on here is I've got a 6E chart of the December contract, and then the Euro-US dollar does not expire on a... Uh, 
on the spot forex market, which is a slightly different, uh, slightly different animal, but it doesn't expire. Long story short, it's uh, uh, nothing magic there. It's fairly simple to figure out. But I essentially have got my little, uh, my little charts there side by side, and when you look at them, you can tell there's slight differences in the price that it trades at, but essentially it is the same the same chart pattern. If I get that over here where they're roughly spread out the same, you can tell that they essentially follow pretty much tick for tick what the other contract is doing. So you can come in here on this market and you can you can chart this, take advantage of, of everything that we have. For example, let's just come in here and put a, if I can find it, we'll put a couple indicators on here. Um, let's just come in and we'll put the volume. Now all of a sudden where we don't have that volume on the uh, euro US dollar, we can come in and we can see the volume picking up. And it's interesting because it reveals some information that most Forex traders may not be aware of. You can see the volume spike here on the, on the futures and it left a big topping tail, you know, indicative of sellers coming in. We see the same exact thing on the, on the spot market. If we saw that trade setup, price action setup, you know, high volume spike, showing some evidence of sellers coming in, break off below the slow, we could see that on here and say, boy, I need to go short. And all I have to do is reach over here and say market sell. And this, it, unfortunately, it pops it back up on my main monitor. Here's my market sell order, stop losses in, take profit is in, click submit, and I'm in the position. If I want to add tape to this, um, I come in here. bring in my tape on the 6E and now I can sit here and read tape on this and I can see what's happening in this market and again I can just come right back in and execute over here on the spot but the the reason that I mention this is you can take a little account it takes about 48 hours to get your account open and funded typically with a Wanda and you can open up this little account and you can kiss sim trading goodbye and start putting on trades that matter to you and that force you to use good money management rules. And uh, and I have to say, the traders that have done this, you know, that I've worked with, typically are the traders that have become successful. It, it'll be the first time in your life if you do this, it'll be the first time where you can ever put on a real trade that feels fairly comfortable because you can size it to fit your account. Yeah, you can still do gold and silver on a Wanda, Brian. Um, you know, the, they have a, a number of different crosses, and they have made what I would say technically is a, um, it is a CFD to me, but it's, it's available to U.S. residents, so it says it's not a CFD, but here's silver, and if I wanted to come in and chart silver, you know, I could put silver up on my, uh, you know, on my chart and on my time and sales. And again, you're going to see the same thing. When you look at the chart patterns, the chart is exactly the same. It's just going to mirror silver. A little bit more of a spread here, but again, I could I could take a trade and let me just bring this in. This tells me that I have available 101 units of silver. So I could size this and say, well, I want five units. And I could put this for uh, for where I want my take profit. Let's say that I wanted to go short silver looking at this chart pattern. And in fact, I'll just put a little trade on. Let's say that I wanted to take a, a target down here at 24. I don't know if you can. Actually, let me just get this out of the way. Let, let's just say this. Let's say I want to go short and I want to take a, a profit down here into this prior low. So I'm going to take my, my take profit order and I'm going to just put this to 24. I'm going to take my stop loss and say, you know, if it goes off over this high, that's good enough. So 24, 54, 70. It, it breaks down into smaller increments. I look at my trade down here and it says, if I, whoop, I need to be on the sell side. Sorry. I'll pay attention next time. Do this again. Take profit, 24. Stop loss. 24, 54, 70. I look down here and it says if I hit my stop loss, it's going to cost me 79 cents. If I hit my take profit, it's going to cost me a buck 97. 
So I can see that before I place the trade. I configure those parameters right in, put the stop where I need it to be, or I can auto configure it. And I'll, I'll just submit the trade. Who cares? Um, you know, we'll just play with it. I, I look at that and say, boy, that might be a little close because of the spread. So I, I may want to give this, uh, you know, just a, just a few ticks because of the spread and put the stop up here. I've got my stop there. Uh, my, my position is the blue line. I've got my take profit there. And I can just shut it down and let the thing go. If it, if it works, it works. Um, the microcurrency futures, Kevin, you're, you're asking, would the microcurrency futures be the same thing? Microcurrency, uh, what the industry refers to as a micro lot, is a $1,000 lot. Initially, a standard lot for most firms was 100 grand, and then a mini lot was 10 grand, and then the micro lot was 1,000. So, on the euro, a micro lot would be 10 cents a tick, and I could literally get this down. Uh, 1,000 times that small. Uh, the other markets that they do, uh, Peter, th th when it comes to, uh, I, I guess, they don't do energies. They do have gold and silver, which would be the only metals. They don't do the S&P. They don't do indices. They don't do anything of that nature. It's all currencies except for the gold and silver. They... Um, have for currency pairs, if you want to look at an exhaustive list, let me just get a quote list here. And I'll pull that in. Uh, for the currency pairs that are available, there's a million pairs in here. I don't even know how many they have, 60, 70 different uh, currency pairs. And, you know, so all of these would be Australian dollar versus something. Uh, all of these are the Canadian versus something, Swiss franc versus something. This is the euro versus other currencies. GBP is the pound versus other currencies. We'll scroll on down here. We've got the New Zealand dollar versus other currencies. Uh, TRY, that's the Turkey, uh, the lira versus the yen. And then all of this stuff, USD is US dollar versus something else. And then ZAR, uh, that would be the, uh, uh, the RAND, uh, South African RAND against the Japanese yen. So they, they have the ability to take just about any currency pair into any other currency, or any currency into any other commonly traded currency, more than most firms have. Um, most of them, I wouldn't trade them. There's not a whole lot of point to them. You know, your, your majors are the ones that you can get, uh, you can get time and sales and you can get uh, volume off of the 6E or the 6B or the 6J. So... Yeah, Sean, you say you're guessing that all currency pairs uh, would mimic the corresponding currency futures on NinjaTrader. Uh, when you look at NinjaTrader, you know, with what's available as far as a currency future, and, and by the way, they are, there are some of the firms set up where you could use Ninja to trade the currency, but you lose the scalability, and it's with firms that are definitely not uh, reputable in the way they treat their customers. But with these currency pairs, you you know, you think of, of what you have on the instrument manager. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just bring that in real quickly here so you guys can see where it's at. When you open up your instrument manager in NinjaTrader, you're going to have a series of contracts that start with the numeral 6, and they will typically come up right at the beginning. And so you've got the 6A, which is the Aussie dollar, 6B is the pound, 6C is Canadian. 6E is the euro, 6J is the yen, 6M is the Mexican peso, 6S is the franc. If you look at those, the 6E has the most volume by far. The 6B is going to have the second most volume, the pound. And that would correlate directly back to the pound US dollar on your spot platform. And then you're going to have the 6J which is the Japanese yen, which would go back and correlate to your U.S. dollar Japanese yen. The other contracts, to my way of thinking, that are available on currency futures do not really have enough volume to be worth tracking them and using that tape to make the decisions for the, for the other market. And the other, uh, the other factor that you're going to look at on on a currency platform is the spread 
And the euro US dollar, forty uh, percent of all transactions that occur in currency on any given day, forty percent of it goes off on the euro US dollar. So you're talking um, one point six trillion uh, dollars worth of transactions going back and forth, either euro into dollar or dollar into euro. $1.6 trillion a day. As a result of that, the 6E has a very, very tight spread, which means um, you know you, you take less than one tick to get to, to a break-even state on that. So while they will mimic the currency futures, the other currency futures, to my way of thinking, don't have enough volume um, to justify doing that. No, if you if you're going to do gold and silver, because the gold and silver is not a currency trade, that would be metals. Uh, so I was, I'm sorry, I was addressing your question specifically about currency futures. But if you were going to do gold and silver, uh, yeah, you would still still be able to go in there, look at your Ninja Trader charts, your Ninja Trader time and sales. Um, you know, when you when you look at where these are, and let me just get rid of this stuff. When you look at where these are in terms of a quote, um, I don't know if I can turn off my position, the show average position. Um, the the quote is 2440, and then they will break that down uh, e- even less than what you know, because when you trade on the the uh, SI contract, you know the silver contract, the futures contract, that trades in half cent increments. And you can see this goes out actually five decimal points. So you would read this as $24 like where it's sitting right now. You would read this as $24. Uh, sorry, my cursor's in the way trying to keep everything out of the way. $24.39. And if you look over here at the at the SI, at the futures contract, it's $24.38.5 by $24.39. So they're trading essentially at exactly the same price. The chart pattern's the same. The uh, you know the volume we've got the ability to put the volume on here and look for volume spikes and so forth, but essentially it's it's going to give you pretty much exactly the same picture on it. So not a lot of volume on silver. Um, you know you can trade it. Uh, ironically, I do trade silver a fair amount, and for the most part, I will not trade. Uh, the silver current, uh, the silver future contract. It is a very, very violent contract, and I've seen uh, spikes, uh, buck, buck and a quarter spikes, where someone will come in and throw a 500 lot market order, and it'll move at a buck in the middle of the night and stop everybody out, and you wake up and all you have is a tail sitting there. So same thing goes for gold. Gold can be pretty dangerous to trade on the on the futures market uh, if you're trying to short gold near a high of day or buy gold near the low of day be careful cuz it can go 4 or 5 points on a uh, on a 2 second spike and be right back so you can definitely get hurt on those big contracts ironically it doesn't happen in here on this contract when gold spikes on futures it doesn't spike here so it's just a it's just something that I I want to put out there for you guys give it a little bit of consideration uh, I didn't intend to go on this long about it. I've already taken up most of our time this morning with this. If you guys have any questions about it, please throw your questions out there. And if it's questions about Forex trading as a separate deal, um, I, I will deal with those questions at a different time. But if you guys have questions about the Forex marketplace, email those to me. And I, I don't mind making a little brief video here over the next couple of weeks. And I'll just put that up for everybody that has questions about it. But I I look at it, like I say, it is a way that we can come in there and successfully trade real money um, without putting ourselves at tremendous risk. You know, worst case scenario, um, you put 50 bucks in there and you trade real money on it, then you get ripped off for the 50 bucks by by the broker. So as long as you're careful about who it is and and the way they treat you – you know, it could work out pretty good. The only thing that I would say about a Wanda and most complaints about Forex firms actually stem from their practices around news releases. And all brokers will widen their spreads around news releases because they were getting destroyed by news traders. And so 
when a when a big news release pops, a Wanda will not fill you for about twenty seconds, and they will widen the spread from nine tenths of a tick. Uh, they will widen that out to ten ticks, and then it will come right back together and trade just like normal. So for your trades that you're taking off a of five minute chart, stuff like that, just don't be initiating positions right into the news. Um, you know these are markets that that tend to trend very well. And because they trend very well, it is related or, or uh, suited well for those kind of strategies. And, uh, you know, you get a news release that moves the S&P six, seven points. Very common for that same release to move the, uh, you know, the euro, uh, you know, a good hundred ticks. So it, it definitely can move them around and, and uh, make some money off of it. Like I said, I've taken thousands of trades uh, off of my Awanda account. And I cannot point to a single trade uh, over those seven years. Cannot point to a single trade where they jipped me, ripped me off, slid me, requoted me. Just filled and done. Very, very uh, fair firm. And they felt that from the very beginning was be fair to the customers and you'll always have customers. So any any questions about that, throw a, throw a quick yes out there. Otherwise, I'm going to shut these platforms off and uh, if I don't see something here in the next 30 seconds then we'll keep going on something else okay so I'm going to close this out and close uh, this out um, the other things that I wanted to do today, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the things that we can try to do as a proxy for the tape. You know what? And actually, maybe maybe this, because we're kind of getting to the point, we've only got about 15 minutes left. Maybe we can take a couple of these things and go through them tomorrow. Because I know the uh, sessions, we've been running over uh, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes each day. and for some of the guys that are overseas, it ends up getting pretty late uh, for them. I was trying to think if there's something. Let's just do this. We'll take the, uh, you know, trying to determine the relevant size on the time in sales. Let's look at this. And I'm going to just put up a, a couple time in sales windows. And I don't know if somebody has a, a specific market that they want to look at. that they're really interested in or if not I'm going to just pick a couple things 6e 6e okay here's what I'm going to do I've got an unfiltered time in sales and I've got a filtered time in sales and if you guys have the ability to put your time in sales up I would put it up um, Look at your own. I, I don't want to get this lagging too much, but it, it would be pretty easy for me to get lagging eight, nine seconds. I'm going to take my filter, and I'm going to shut that filter down, and I'm going to filter out the one lots. I'm just going to set this at twos, and that will give us a little more time. If the tape gets going too fast, um, it's going to slow down, and I won't be able to do this. So I'm going to just... The, the time and sales on the right, we'll start putting some numbers out there. Um, those numbers are going to be, you know, one lot are gone, so it's just two lots or bigger. And here's here's what we've got. This is showing uh, 55 lines here. And so we, we've got the screen where it sits right now. We've got the 4033 print at the top. And we'll, we'll just let that 43 clear off. But we can say right now out of 55 prints, when we scan down that list, we've got an 8 lot. And that was the biggest print there. The 8 lot's gone. We've got a 10 lot there. That's the biggest print. And you'll probably see this a tad bit delayed. 50's gone, an 8 lot. 50's gone, an 8 lot. 50's gone. We've got an 8 lot. Somebody's trading 8 lots today. 50's gone, the 7 is the big. So 
So we've we've looked at a couple hundred prints here. Here's another 50 showing two lot is the biggest print. Can you, can you guys see this okay on your end? Or you've got your own up? It looks like I'm, from what I can tell, it looks like I'm running about three to four seconds behind. We've got another 50 visible there. Largest one I see is a three. Another 50. Largest one I see is a four. So so here's what we're going to look at. It's pretty consistent out of every 50 prints. Six or seven or eight is about as big as it gets. We look down the right-hand column. We don't have a single double-digit print out of 50 filtered prints. I'm determining the 50, Brian, because I've got 55 lines tall on my time and sales. So if I look at, like right now, where the 4036s are up at the top and I've got five one lots, when those are gone and they disappear off the screen, when I glance at that screen, I've got 55 lines. So I'm just rounding it and saying, okay, out of 50 prints there, the largest one visible right now is a six. See, I just, I'm just letting it clear and scroll down. Here's a nine lot that's the biggest visible on there. So if that's the case, could I could I watch this for just a couple minutes like that and say what's relevant on that market? Well, this would show you what's relevant uh, through the doldrums the early afternoon. And if we come in there in the morning, there might be some bigger prints. So so we can file that away and say, you know, so far we still have only had one double digit print on this. We had one ten lot that went by out of all the ticks that that passed so now we go to step two of this what do we see for bots and 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 let me let me rephrase that what do we see that looks like bots see there's a 24 that's you know two and a half times bigger than the biggest print we've had but what do we see that looks like bots that would be the way the exchange is processing the orders and this would be for stuff that just drops into place See, we could still say there's there's big trades there, you know, because because we've got a series of prints that are that are dropping in all at the same exact time. Like I, I'm going to just freeze this here with my screen draw. But if you look at this section here, that that starts at the top and runs down to here, every one of those trades had the same timestamp. All of it dropped into place simultaneously. So we look at that and say this was a market order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 orders, 16 lots that all dropped into place simultaneously at the same stamp. Very likely that that was a 16 lot market order and it was all ones in the queue with the exception of that 1, 2 lot. So is that, does that make sense? We, we can see there's some market orders going on there that are still sizable, but for the bigger executions, if we were trying to filter it out for the bigger executions, we have to say there's really not that many. So to me, if I look at an instrument like that, I would say the the 20 and 30 lot guys, those are going to be significant traders. Uh, whether it was 20 or 30, or whether you know it was one print at 20 or 30. So I, I could look at that and I could start tracking this and saying on any given flurry that just drops into place, what kind of size do we have? You know, I'm seeing these flurries like all the 38s that come through with an 01 timestamp. Let me just freeze it again. Sorry, I, I tend I forget that this is coming in and you guys aren't seeing it for a few seconds. Again, we have the uh, the same thing happening here where all of these come in with the same timestamp, all at the same price. Again, we, we look at it, can we do just a quick estimate? If we know we got 55 rows, we're just shy of half, could we confidently say there's probably 25 lots there? You know, I mean, we could count them up, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I look at that, just the size it was, my guess was 25, there's 22. So when we look at that type of behavior, we can then start to say what would be uh, indicative of a larger trader. We get half a screen. 
that drops into view all simultaneously, that was probably a large market order. The, the reason those will be the same color, uh, I've got a question from Pete. It says, is the coloring right on that current screen? You have the 4038s green and red all at the same time. Uh, the, there were some of those, but that's the difference. Remember, we were talking about the bid and the ask colors, the bid and the offer. So remember, the bids were red. And then when we immediately get green at the same price, that tells you that that price moved as as far as where the inside bid and the ask was. They're moving. Does that make sense? The the best bid ask price ticked up or ticks down, and so they can come in with the same timestamp. Could have been part of the same order. It could have moved price up one tick. You know because those were not any longer at the bid. Uh, the question, when they all come in with the same timestamp, is that a bot? Karen, that, that is the behavior that looks like a bot, but because there are, um, there are essentially in that queue that's waiting to be filled there, the majority of them are one and two lot guys. And so if a 15 lot comes in, it may take 15 one lot prints to show on our tape. Uh, a year ago, you would say, yes, that was a bot. Now, when you look at it, you just say that's the way they're now presenting it. They're not showing it any longer um, on the basis of being a 15-lot order. They're showing it on the basis of being uh, how many executions did it take to fill that 15-lot order. Uh, Pete, when you asked, do you think that that really happens where price moves up a tick and back down? It it happens very frequently. In fact, let's let's just put a dome in here. And again, it, it's not going to uh, it's not going to transfer instantly. I can get my dome. I've got so many windows from this go to webinar thing. I can't even drag stuff in and out. I don't know what's going on. Don't want to let me drag it in at all now. Huh. Try another one. Oh, I've got my screen drawn. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, why it wouldn't let me drag the, <laughs> the dome into view. And it's because the uh, screen draw had the whole thing froze up. If you If you get your dome up, Pete, and watch that move, um, if somebody comes in and puts, let's just let's just freeze this so we can talk about the current number. Let's just assume that somebody comes in and places a 30 lot order, and and they take that order. You know, down here it's 30 lots, and let's say that they come click into this spot right here. Now, for anybody that's using Ninja, what you realize that's going to do is that's going to place a limit order which will instantly execute off at 36. If you put a 20 lot order there, that will instantly clear out this 14 and it will leave your remaining orders sitting here as a new offer. So what happens then if instantly the guy here says, no, I'm going to, I'm going to put more at 36. He can come back in and instantly hit the remaining portion of your order. And you see that, where it, where it drops and it went offer and then just immediately was lost and went back bid. And so we go flash, flash, and the color changes on the time and sales. You know, it goes red prints, green prints, right back to red prints. So that was what I was talking about with the drills, is as you watch those prints change, where, where you've got the same prints at a price. Like we see green prints, remember what green represents? In our time in sales, we get a green print. I'll let somebody throw an answer out there. Right, right, Brian. Green print is the offer, the bid. Remember, the green print, that is a market order that came over here and hit the offer. Remember, the green has five letters. Offer has five letters. Uh, the bid, bid and red, they both end in a D. I don't know, whatever you want to do, three letters. So we see a green print over here at 37. We see a green, a red print here at 37. So we, so we think about what that represents. If the red print at 37 here at this price, let me clear off the, the arrow there. 
we've got a red print here at 37. The red print would indicate to us then that the bid was sitting right here. Somebody sold at the market to 37. And then we've got the next print is green at the same price. That would indicate that this was now the offer. D does that make sense as you look at this here on our tape? We had a red print go off at 37. That means that was a market seller that hit the bid over here at 37. And then the very next print is green 37. So if a green 37, green means a market buyer, and a market buyer came back across and hit 37, and that's what resulted in the green print. So we see red 37 turn to green 37. We know price just ticked down. We see, you know, the opposite of that. We see a green 37 turn to red 37. That tells us that price just ticked up. That's part of that, like with those drills, if you can get your time and sales right there by your, by your dome, and you start kind of drilling that, watching that, in your mind, you'll you'll understand where the market is moving and whether they're able to hold levels and what they're doing with those levels um, without necessarily seeing that on a chart or seeing that on your dome. Now, just just one thing I will mention as a proxy for uh, for this, if you have trouble keeping track of that, um, again, it's beneficial to have those time and sales close, get them up, snugged up on each side of your dome. And if you have to watch it flipper back and forth here in the middle where you know because you've got this green which is your last uh, and green your gray which is your last print you can watch that flicker back and forth as to where the bid and the offer moves uh, you've got your momentum running down the sides where you can still see on the sides that uh, momentum change I think I've got I don't know if I've got all the questions there let me read back through and make sure Yeah, I don't see anything there as far as unanswered questions. Did, did that make sense to everybody, or do do I need to go through that again? If anybody wants me to go through it again, okay. Let, let somebody asked if I can go through it again. Let's do this. Let's turn it off, and I'll turn the screen draw back on, and and let's look at the prints that are sitting here right now. Let's just go back to the, this flurry, uh, starting right in here, and and we're going to look at this this little section of our tape. We had prints, and this is at a 17 second timestamp. We had prints that came in green, red, green, and these prints came in with the same timestamp. Okay, so so let's let's analyze this again with what this meant. The green print at 37. Back here, what did that indicate to us? We see a green print that was a market buyer, and the market buyer had to come over here, and he hit 37. Okay? Next print, we see a red print at 37. So we think about the red print. That means that somebody hit the bid, right? It was a seller who came in and hit the bid. So that tells us now that 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 seller came in uh he hit this price immediately at the at the same time as this one here printed on the opposite side so again what does that tell us about the price what did price do price lifted we went green red at the same price that means price went up and then we go back to green Again, to go back to green, that means uh, if we think about where the offer was for a market buyer to come hit the offer, that means the offer came back to 37. So if we were to reconstruct that little sequence right there, we would say, you know, wh where the, the initial prints here, these initial 37s, at that moment in time, because that was the, the buyer coming in, the offer was at 37. And then it came up and the bid went to 37 on these red prints over here. And then it came back down again and the offer moved back down into that spot. So if we were watching that on our time and sales at that point and understood it correctly, 
you know, we could build that in our head and come back over here and say, what happened? We saw the bid go from 36 to 37, back to 36. And and Pete, in in thinking about the question you had asked earlier, you know, you had asked about this some months back, or just, I guess was well, been a couple months ago, about seeing some differences in your trade station versus your ninja, and in in looking at that, and I've asked questions of a couple people that have both. They felt that their ninja was running faster and more accurately than their trade station was. And remember the criteria that we placed on this when it comes to coloring those prints was based on whether it went off at the bid or the ask. And they felt that they were they were updating more quickly where that bid and ask was uh, on that basis than what it was updating on their trade station. So I don't know if that's the explanation for that, but if you watch that happen, you know, just just take your dome. If you've got your 6E dome up, watch how frequently the bid will move up and then it drops again, moves up, drops again, and it just instantly, it moves up, drops again. Uh, Gary, just you, you ask, when you see what you're explaining, what would be your outlook on the market at that time as far as long or short? Um, that would not push me into a trade one way or the other. See, first of all, I would have to go back and look at where it was on a chart. What what did the chart look like? Was it rallying up into resistance? If it was rallying up into resistance and I see them uh, raise a level and immediately lose it, and they raise a level and immediately lose it, and they raise a level and immediately lose it, and this keeps happening and they cannot hold that level, that's what I'm talking about when I say they can't they can't go bid. In other words, they can't get the bid back up to this price. And they try and they try and they try. And every time they get the bid back up to this price, it immediately gets kicked back. It, it's an indication to me, one, I'm at resistance. That means I'm interested in a short. Now they cannot get that level to stick. They, they could get the bid there to 37, but they could not hold 37, and the sellers immediately knocked them back. So if I combine that fact with some selling coming in on the tape at 37s and I see a big flurry of sellers coming in 36, 37s, then I would go ahead and, and look at that as the basis of a trade. Uh, Brian, your comment, the bid moved up and then down. That's confusing. You're thinking the red print at 40, 37, so thinking market is going down, but actually it ticked up. See, remember, Brian, that, that those prints, when they just come in very quickly, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, it it's trying to hold a level. Now, when we put a series of those prints there, and let's let's clarify this. Let me just get rid of all of this, and we'll freeze a new section. And, and this is maybe this will explain it a little better. What what I'm referring to specifically is tracking where the bid and the offer is. But we could also look at this. And, and we could start down here, and we could say we see this go 57s, and then it – and let me just draw the arrows this way because price is moving down. We go 59s to 58s to 57s to 56s, and then it goes back up from 56s. We get some 57s. We get some 57s selling, 57s selling, 56s. So when you see that sequence on the tape, where would you say the tape is actually going? You know, granted, it's it's jiggling back and forth, but we're talking about a market where on the dome at this moment in time, that inside market is only five lots. So if guys are coming in and they're placing 10 lot, 15 lot market orders, that can bang it around two or three ticks. But bottom line the, the sequence of momentum at this moment on this visible tape that I've stalled, the sequence is primarily down. Even though they ticked it up a couple times in that sequence, overall it's down. They, they lost it from 59s down to 56s. So is, is that – let me, let me look at it this way. Is that harder to track the bid and offer on an instrument like this? or on an instrument like the ES. And I would say it's harder on the ES. You think about why that's harder? I'm sorry, it's harder on the 6E. 
But you think about why I would say it's harder here is it changes, the bid and ask changes so quickly on instruments like the 6E and the Crude, and it's just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It just jumps and jumps and jumps and jumps. Back and forth, twitchy. So we might come into a market like this and say it's more important to have uh, the, the sequence of trades, the flow of the trades, than it is just to say, did they tick the bid up? You know, did they tick the bid up two, three times? Because it, it will jump around. It will move around. I mean, I look at it at any given point here. You know, we're, we're looking at uh, all five levels combined. We're only talking 100 lots. We come over on the S&P, and, and we look at the S&P and say, you know, there's 2,000 there. They go back and forth, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, but it's all at the same price. The, the bid actually didn't move up. It's just the red prints, and then the green prints, and then the red prints, and then the green prints. So... So price didn't necessarily move. The execution moved, but the bid-ask spread didn't change. You come onto a thin one, and you're going to see the actual bid-ask spread ratchet up and down considerably more. Uh, Karen, your comment, I think spending more time on this kind of stuff would be helpful even on the YM. Uh, you mentioned you were watching some replay last night, and it's still a bit confusing. And that's that's what I'm going to go through a, a bit more on the YM because uh, – to me, if a guy was going to trade just off the tape, it's easier to do it on one that ratchets up and down a little bit. But if we're doing it, uh, you know, with a chart, and, and that's why, you know, one of the things that we're going to be discussing over the next couple of days, uh, sitting here with this and saying, with the instrument that I like to trade, what method of tape reading do I need to use there? So, Gary, appreciate the comment, and uh, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. So we'll we'll keep doing that. It's it is the nice feature with the replay. We can come in here and and essentially freeze frame the market. Um, it, it is kind of difficult with tape reading, and that's the thing I've never liked about tape reading. From the standpoint of a mentorship or a live session with people, is when I put it up and it's moving fast, you're going to be six seven seconds behind. Uh, it, it will literally slow down my voice. It will slow down the entire transmission. So, um, you know, sometimes we, we're going to have to freeze frame it and just break it down with what's visible right there. I don't know if this, you know, you, this section may be a little confusing. Go back and watch it a couple times if you need to when I get the recording out tonight. And then see if it makes more sense as you watch it. Again, we're just, we're simply, you know, we started out talking about where the bid ask was moving and, and it, it, that's not necessarily the best thing to do for this instrument. Um, you know, we would be interested more in looking at the sequence of prints. Um, you know, just for example, uh, trading this on the basis of the tape, I see them lose 59s and they lose it back down to 56s. And we look at how long it took them to go from 59s to 56s. We start out clear down here at the bottom. I don't know if you guys can can barely see that. But we were printing 59s at 05 and 4 seconds. And and they went to 58s at the same time. We're still 05s at the very last bit of this. That's 15 seconds later. It took about 15 seconds to go from 59s to 56s. Now, we might turn around if we're watching that continuous flow, and they may be right back at 59 in two seconds or three seconds. And so you watch that and say, you know, they really, it took them a while to get it down here, but they came back instantly. So now you watch them again, and they push from 59, they push back to 56, and it takes them 25, 30 seconds to get back to 56. And then three, four seconds is right back at 59s. What what does that tell you, just from a logical viewpoint, if it's taken you 15, 20 seconds to knock it down three ticks, but you can come back those three ticks in three seconds, what would be a logical conclusion if you're going to scalp this on, that, on, on the tape? You see this repeat half a dozen times. They, they try to knock it down, takes 15, 20, 30 seconds takes uh, three, four, five seconds to come back. And then the next time it goes down, maybe it takes five, ten seconds longer. And, and then it's three, four seconds, it's back. 
Yeah, so you start – we've got a couple good comments here. Brian says sellers are losing. Absolutely right. They're trying to knock it down, and it's it's a struggle to get it down. Uh, Karen says pay attention to those levels and watch for it to repeat. Well, we start watching that. If if we're trading something that's 5 bucks a tick, we're not going to do very well trying to get a tick out of the middle with our commissions. But if we're doing something that is uh, – you know, where there's some tick value there as a scalper, we may be able to come in and get two, three ticks, make 30 bucks and out, make 30 bucks and out, make 30 bucks and out. Uh, Kevin, you know, you, you're saying buy. And if that fits with your chart analysis, you're absolutely correct. You're coming into an area where you would expect some support and, and they're trying to drive it down and they can't drive it down and very quickly they come back. You may see this over the course of a minute or two and say, forget it. We get 56s. I'm going long. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to put a stop at 54s, 55s as a scalper and see if we can get 60s. If they ram it back up, let's see if we can get 60s out of this thing. But when it indicates to us, you know, we, we don't know subsequent to this how long it took to push back up. But we see that changing and that momentum is definitely to the downside. And they're just in 15 seconds, they've lost three levels and, and we get a wiggle back up and, and that wiggle is kind of slow coming back up. Um, and, and they can't get it back up there real quickly, and we're against support, or excuse me, we're against resistance, and we close it. You know, we've got just an immediate uh, short trade in play. So, you know, would would that work out? Well, you know, price ran right back down into the 40s. You know, we've got our... our jumpiness going on it must be some news there you see that how the the tape has accelerated in fact you guys probably aren't seeing it off of my display it's being recorded there but you can see the dome going crazy and what i was thinking is we've got something there going on with it and you can you could see it on the tape as soon as i unfroze it it was like huh what's going on <laughs> I'm not looking at news this morning to see what's happening because I'm not trading. So, yeah, that's what I've. Several of you got the comments there at the FOMC Fed. Yeah, it's kind of funny because it's uh, you know we're talking about the tape and looking at the tape and I I unfreeze it and I'm sitting here looking at it frozen up on my end and. That first screen flashes by at one second, and it was like something's going on. <laughs> Got some news coming here. That's what I was talking about, uh, seeing that momentum and the pace of the tape, and very quickly being able to tell that something's changed in the market. We forgot a news release or some unexpected news came into the market. And... But anyhow, well, let's do this. Um... I'm going to get rid of the uh, time and sales in the dome. And if anybody has questions, let's go ahead and uh, throw those questions out. Just give me a quick yes if you have questions. We're going we're gonna to talk about this topic anymore. Uh, Ken, some, some people... Ken, Ken is asking, why would anyone want to trade from the tape and not use charts? Uh, some scalpers are definitely interested in that. And it's not that they won't use a chart, but they may look at the chart and say, I think it's going down, and they don't want to watch the chart at all. They just want to trade off the tape and scalp from it. But I think the, probably the most common thing is there's a bit of a mystique about being able to, to read tape and trade from a chart. Uh, takes away from that mystique. It's kind of like uh, sometimes price action traders get all belligerent acting with somebody that uses uh, one moving average on their chart. And it's ludicrous. If you can make money with it and that moving average helps you make money, who cares? You know, I, if I want to paint pink dots on my chart and it helps me make money, I'll paint pink dots on the chart. It's, um, you know, I, I, I do think, though, that sometimes – People view a tape reader, you're not a tape reader if you still have a chart up. You have to go with no chart whatsoever. And, you know, to do that, you still have to have a number in your head. You still have to have a general indication of, of where the market is in its structure. 
So, uh, Sean, your comment, you see enormous activity on the 60. That's what we've been talking about with the uh, FOMC statement or FOMC meeting. Um, I, I already closed out my spot platform. It, it will be moving tick for tick. It's it's going to be a 10 tick spread. It's going to ratchet up and down very quickly, and then it'll come right back to a nine tenths of a tick and uh, and run. But the the bad thing I, I was kind of watching. I have a little tiny screen that's about uh, I don't know what it is three inches wide, four inches wide, and it lets me see what you guys are currently seeing. And for the most part, it's running about one second behind. If I change the slide, it's it's taking about one second before you guys see the slide change. But when I put up those two time and sales, I was running about eight or nine seconds. Was what it looked like to me when they were when they were running fast. So it it is kind of difficult to put that through. As far as all you guys that are here now, if is there anyone that does not have access to a time and sales at this point? Because we're gonna, as we, especially next week, as we get into some trading, um, I, I'm going to tape mine, but it it will actually slow my voice down where you start hearing me seven eight seconds after the fact, and it would be better not to be broadcasting those. So I just, if if someone still does not have a time and sales in a dome, uh, please put it out here. And and I will again. I will direct you to a couple brokers that can get you set up very quickly, um, so that you have a platform. So far, no, nobody has said that. So I'm assuming you all have that because when we when we go forward with this, um, it, it is going to be easier for you guys to have your own up and to be watching them and have my voice coming in a quarter of a second later uh, than it would be to have it up and have mine coming in jumping and and blocky and flash and black and it, it doesn't transmit real clean. I mean you can see that if you've got your your 6e open still. Um if you take your 6e set it up right next to this, you'll notice it, it is just sending you a snapshot like every second or two or 5 or 6. So the they it doesn't broadcast real well. The the recording will be clean, but it, it won't send, submit out to you guys very well. Uh, Tom, those are those are pretty simple to get them running. Did you did you get that version seven demo set up yet or? Okay, and do you know how to get your time and sales open? And I, I think I sent you a link to the little video on setting up. Okay. Shoot me an email if you if you run into any weird issues with it. I'll, uh, you know, I think the videos that I sent you link to on the screencast they're they explain pretty well how to do it, how to set it up. What what are you guys seeing? Uh, if if one of you has your six E up off of my broadcast, does it look like you're running considerably behind? Oh really, Gerardo? I one or two seconds. I I would on my end. It looks like it's running seven or eight. I mean, it's definitely not fluid. If you look at yours, and yours is not time compressed, my you know it's not going to be very fluid. Hey Brian, if you're still here, would you would you mind checking on yours? Because I think I know you're on seven. And so you're going to be uncompressed. I just, when I look at the snapshots that it's sending through to you guys, it looks like it's just sending still photos and I'm clicking through a slide presentation really fast. It's not fluid at all. So... Appreciate the comment there. Um, any of you guys that need to go, we'll probably just a little bit of chit chat here. Appreciate the comments there. About a second. Oh wow, I didn't didn't figure it would be pushing through. Is it pretty blocky looking compared to yours, Brian? Uh, 
a display interval of zero, uh, that would be uh, no time compression whatsoever when you do that on your properties. If it's a, a point two five, that would be 250 milliseconds. Mine is zero. See, on, on mine, it's just screaming by. In fact, I, let me just do this. You guys won't won't see it. Oop, I can't even hold it there. It just disappears. I, I was trying to put up the uh, little window that lets you see what I see um, as far as, uh, you know, it, it shows me a little mini screen of what you guys are viewing. And it won't even let me put it up in that window that's broadcasting. I was going to try to just record it there so you guys could see what it looked like. If I hold it, I can hold it over here and make it happen. And then if you guys watch the tail end of the recording from today, you'll kind of see the difference between the way mine is screaming by and the little snapshot that you guys are getting. So just, just out of curiosity, if you guys want to know. Well, guys, I sure appreciate all the questions. Um, for any of you, I still have, uh, I, I've got a couple uh, trade setups that people have asked me to go through. But for any of you guys that indicated your willingness, I still only have a couple of them. And all we need is just a simple screenshot. Uh, we're going to go through some of that. Uh, maybe, maybe Karen, are you going to be around on Friday? If you're going to be around on Friday, maybe we can go through yours on Friday. Huh, still one or two seconds, Gerardo. I mean, it's not going to be as smooth, but at least it's not delaying it for hours. Okay, so, so Karen, we'll go through yours on Friday, and then uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name for sure. He had to just leave, but uh, he, just, uh, he sent me some stuff that he's been working on, and he's trying to get away from some indicators, and he wanted to go through some of his. So anybody else that wants to get those in, just a simple snapshot. You can do that right out of Ninja um, as well. You know, if you're on your chart, I don't know if you guys, are, are you guys aware of how to do that? Like if I wanted to get a snapshot of this here. You, you can come down in, just right click on your chart and you go down to image and then you go save as and that will just take a screenshot of your chart. So if anybody that wants to ask, just get a simple screenshot of your chart, and I can let you just explain what you're, what you're uh, kind of looking at or what levels, whether it's high of day or low of day or exactly what you're looking at. So, well, I'm going to stop. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to double check this to make sure we don't have any more questions out there. I've got my. Uh, Euro position is in a profit. I'm, I was up 40 ticks at one point. I was up 150 ticks on that spike, but the 40 ticks has only got me three cents of profit. So you can kind of see little teeny positions like that. Even if a guy put 10 bucks in there, you can do a lot of back and forth and back and forth, you know, without, uh, without doing serious financial damage to yourself. To get a screenshot, a complete screen with more than one chart, Brian, um, there, there's a techsmith.com. They've got a product called Jing, and I'll, I'll send you a link to that. It lets you get a good screenshot. Uh, you can do a trial for, for Snagit. That lets you get a really good screenshot. You can actually get multiple monitors on that. But if you've got multiple charts, it may be easier to get multiple charts open. And, uh, uh, you know, just, just shoot each one individually and say, okay, I'm looking at this and this and this. And it might be a little cleaner if we get more than one picture and just cycle through a couple of them. So, 
I must have stopped out on that spike. Yeah, I spiked out on that, uh, stopped out on that uh, trade on the silver. You can see it definitely took a big spike. Shot up, what, all the way to 24.90 on that uh, release. Must have been some information on the release that nobody was expecting because, boy, it went one way and then the other spiked fast. So anyways, so what I get for opening a sub account, now I got a loser on there. So, well, I will quit there and we will talk with you guys tomorrow. We'll, uh, we'll cover the final couple topics that we didn't get to today. Anybody that has questions specifically on the Forex stuff, send me an email and I will get you some more information there privately on that. But I, I do encourage people just to think about it at least, e even if you keep trading live on your futures account, uh, use something like this instead of the SIM. Uh, you'll still be able to come in there and, and uh, do some live trades with real money, still practice your skills, still get a little emotion in it, and uh, and it will let you do it, you know, where it's not going to hurt you financially. So, well, you guys have a have a great afternoon. I'm going to cut the recorder off here and cut the broadcast off here, and we'll see you tomorrow at 12 Eastern. Thanks for the comments too, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, they, usually they come in so fast you can't respond personally to everybody there, so. Appreciate it, guys. We'll get a video out to you guys again uh, this afternoon. And like I say, if you want to, if you want to see kind of the little teeny shot that I show, it's uh, it's kind of funny. It's like having a little miniature TV on a wristwatch. So <laughs> we'll we'll talk to you guys later.